<clears throat> All right. So I think we have some folks joining us. And we'll get started in just a moment. We're live on Facebook, so that's good. All right, folks. Um, because we're recording and it's noon, everybody heard our, our uh, sirens. I'll get started here. So welcome, you've tuned in to the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery um, Artist Talk Series for the exhibition Build It, Artists Creating Community in Ohio. Today, we'll hear from um, an ex one of the exhibition artists, Glenn Sebulash. Um, Glenn resides in Oakwood, Ohio, and that's right near Dayton and is a recipient of the Ohio Arts Council's Individual Excellence Award. He's also a professor in the Department of Art and Art History at Wright State University. Um, and before I, I give you any more information on Glenn, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, this is being recorded and it is being live streamed to Facebook. Um, so in the future, in the near future, we'll have a captioned option for you to view if you'd like that. Um, and then also, please, please feel free to engage by asking questions in the comment um, section for Zoom or for Facebook, and then the chat section for Zoom. Uh, we'll be sure to get to those questions towards the end of the talk, uh, but feel free to ask them at any point during the talk. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Glenn. Here you are. Thank you. Thanks, Kat. Um, I'd, I'd first like to um, just start by thanking my friend and former student, Erica Hess, for inviting me to participate in the exhibition. She's a wonderful artist, teacher, independent curator, and podcaster, and um, living proof that the profession of teaching can be profoundly rewarding. And next, I'd like to thank Kat and Amy Wisman for all of their assistance and honestly for their patience with a, a very technical technologically challenged individual. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge and just thank my fellow artists in the Build It exhibition. It's an honor to show with all of them. I, uh, I should say up front that as terrified as I am generally of long, uncomfortable pauses, I'm likely to inflict some on you today. I, I, I love to talk, but I'm also a staunch visualist and I'm, I'd like nothing more than for the work to speak for itself. In my fantasy artist talk, I show slides for an hour, don't say a word, and then we all leave. Of course, I don't think Kat would appreciate that very much, and I promised Erica I wouldn't be disagreeable. I should say also, and it's probably the teacher in me, but I've prepared this talk with a series of notes. If it sometimes sounds and, and or looks as if I'm reading, I probably am. I admit my preference would be to give a talk in person there's a strange disembodied quality to a Zoom talk and it's one I haven't mastered. I'll ask for your patience at the outset and hope we can have some more extemporaneous dialogue toward the end of the hour. So I'm gonna just jump right in here uh, with some images. I received my BFA from Boston University in 1988 and my MFA from American University in 1991. My undergraduate training was pretty traditional. It focused on learning to paint, sculpt, and draw, particularly the figure from observation and memory. This image, though not done at Boston University, is pretty typical of the work I was doing as a student. In graduate school, perhaps as a form of rebellion, I'm not sure yet, I, I came to really embrace experimentation and pure abstraction, but perceptual painting had a strong hold on me and informed my work for many years after. In fact, I think the main thrust of the work from this period, from about 1994 until 2000, or around the year 2000 rather, is trying to reconcile these two seemingly irreconcilable impulses to work from to observation, but to paint the essential abstraction that lies beneath the surface events. There are a great many examples I could point to 
and many, many influences, too many to acknowledge. But I think a good example of the kind of tension and resolution I'm referring to is a painting like Cezanne's House of the Hanged Man, where the naturalistic form and space is balanced against the structural geometry and the lucid two-dimensional design. Or possibly Paul Serussier's Talisman, a painting that I failed to recognize as a landscape the first half dozen times I saw it. In both instances, one can see the internal struggle of the work to represent the world, but seen through a unique perception, and one that is finally conscious of how the abstract structure of the work competes with, and in the case of the Serussier, even threatens to dominate the viewer's experience. I must admit that although my work has moved in a somewhat different direction, I remain quite taken with the problems and implications of perceptual painting. And I still feel it informs me and my work to this day. So the first group of paintings I'll show today are done between the years 1994 and 2004. This first painting um, is an, an important one for me. It, it represents a kind of a breakthrough along the lines that I was describing a moment ago. For one thing, it's the first landscape that I ever really painted. But more importantly, for me anyway, it was the first time that I looked directly at nature and could clearly see a completely abstract reading of it. That is to say, a form or set of forms below the surface of appearances that seem to be holding those appearances together. Landscape played a crucial role in my burgeoning awareness of this admittedly subjective phenomenon. One of the things that landscape does so well is forge connections between things, the way one branch of a tree reaches out and is completed in its movement by the branch of another, or the way the sky insists on coming forward and butting up against the objects in the foreground. Of course, I painted other subjects too, particularly still life, which is trickier in some ways. For one, the objects themselves are more insistent, more discreet, more nameable, perhaps. It's harder to get away from them without being very willful about it. As you can see here, it was necessary for me to generalize the things, to erase much of their detail, their personality in some ways, in order to find a suitable abstraction to paint. I should say that I love still life painting, but it's not something I feel I can do with any sensitivity. I think to paint still life well, one has to not only re respect the objects, but in a sense to love them. In 1996, I took a job at Wright State University. I moved to Dayton and continued to work in this vein for some time, making hundreds of paintings and drawings in the process of which, is, of which this is a very tiny sample. I'm not gonna dwell on this work for very long. It was a very important period of my life as a painter. I don't disavow any of it, but it isn't what interests me these days. The main thing I can say about this work, whether it's a still life or a landscape, is that it exists along that spectrum between representation and abstraction. And by the time I was done with it, I knew I didn't wanna be a perceptual painter anymore. So now I'm just gonna show you a couple of examples of work that I was doing at the time. Um, you know, just I'll remark briefly and, and come back to some of this a little bit later in, in a slightly different way. These were works that were done um, almost exclusively on site, you know, which is to say I went out into the landscape with my easel. Um, the other thing that I think I can say with regard to these paintings is, and I think it's fairly obvious that you can see um, that they're painted with a palette knife uh, almost exclusively. Um, I, I worked for many years in, as I said, in the landscape and worked almost exclusively with a palette knife during that period of time. Here's an example of a, a still life painting from 
around that period as well. And then finally, uh, another landscape um, in Dayton also. Around 2000, I began to feel somewhat restless with this observational work. I began to experiment with painting from my imagination. The work was figurative and drawn from personal experience. In this case, my time working as a house painter. As I said a moment ago, I didn't want to be a perceptual painter anymore, but I didn't necessarily think I wanted to be an abstract or a non-objective painter. My thinking at the time was that memory and invention represented a viable third way. A great many artists whom I admired from the Renaissance through the 20th century worked in a similar manner. And for a number of years, I tried to make a go of this myself. One of the interesting things I came to realize, and it, I realize it almost sounds confessional now, but what ultimately led me to the work I've been doing for the last 12 years or so is that the thing that interested me most in painting wasn't the landscape or perception or representation, but the material itself, the color, the forms, the organization, and the process. And in the next couple of slides, what I'm going to do is sort of walk through that. Um, I'm, I'm hesitant to use the word evolution. I don't, I don't think it's necessarily an evolution, but um, it was nonetheless the, the journey um, that I took, uh, which ultimately led to the work that I've been doing over the last um, 12 years or so. This work is like the landscape painting done uh, fairly rapidly and um, is and, and spontaneously, usually kind of repeating motifs as I work through them. Uh, in, in, in the case of a painting like this, you can see some evidence of, of the drawing process still um, present within the painting. This is a, a, a somewhat larger painting, uh, again, done fairly improvisationally. I think the important thing to, to perhaps note right here is that I'm, um, you can see that the, it's hard to let go of certain things, uh, the figure perhaps being the most prominent of the, the, the things I'm referring to, um, but maybe just hard to let go of the visible world in some ways. Um, and it's, it's a little like the still life problem that I mentioned earlier. Uh, it wasn't the figure that I was interested in, but I felt that somehow abandoning the figure was the wrong thing to do. Um, and, and as I've reflected on this, I've, I've often thought that it's just perhaps a matter of um, identity itself. You know, one associates with a certain way of thinking or working for a period of time. And then, um, you know, when you begin to realize that that's not who you really are, uh, you know, that you're, you're somebody else uh, as a painter, for instance, um, it's, there's, there's, there can be a, a kind of an awkward transition. It was certainly the case for me. This is an image that is painted very close to the time I decided to completely abandon all references to the, the visible world, um, outside of painting, that is. I wouldn't call it a breakthrough necessarily, perhaps something more like a letting go. Um, I realized around this time that while I had nothing ideologically against representation, you know, as a, a way of making paintings, it was aesthetically necessary for me 
to abandon um, those references. The second group of paintings I'm going to show this afternoon represent the work I've been doing since around 2005. As I hope is plain, one can see the, the final transition from that piece in the, the last painting I showed to the completely non-objective work that I'm making now. I hope that transition is easy enough to see. I, I you know, I recognize, I sometimes fear that it's a, a bit of a schizophrenic portrait I'm painting, going from one kind of work to another. Um, and uh, as I search through my own images, I sometimes wonder if there are, you know, those missing links. I think that this is one of them. It's a drawing done um, on, uh, you know, with ink and uh, white out actually on and, um, and torn paper. And um, I think if you look closely, you can still see some figurative elements in the picture and, and references to some of the spaces that I was working with in uh, some of those earlier paintings. But I think that it's pretty much moving in the direction that um, I would eventually go. Here too is a, a, another example a little bit later on, uh, an, another drawing done with, with ink and white out. Um, and where the, the figurative references, I think, are disappearing more. Um, and, but, but there's probably still some vestigial or residual uh, reference in my own mind to a certain kind of a space. Perhaps it's an interior space um, or a, um, uh, you know, like an, uh, some sort of objective space. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Now, um, I'm gonna switch gears here just for a second. Um, the paintings that I'm, I'm gonna get into, the, the paintings that are in the exhibition and, and, and the work that I'm doing now, um, uh, when they're seen quickly um, or, or digitally, um, I think they give the impression of being hard-edged geometric abstractions. Um, I, I wanted to show you this close up so that you can see the shapes and the forms are, are not only painted by hand, but the surfaces themselves are pretty worked over. Um, this, this is a detail from a painting I'll show in a moment and one that's also in the exhibition. Um, I think the best way that I can describe the process of these paintings is to say that it's, it's like a very slow motion, totally improvised game of, of, of telephone. If, if you recall that, that game, um, I used, we used to play this when I was a kid, you know, you'd have 20 kids or so in a classroom and one would um, say something into the next one's ear and so on and so forth. And then by the end, the, the message would be completely changed. Um, perhaps at, at times, I suppose, not even, um, uh, didn't even make any that. Um, I, I sort of, I work this way um, now, which is to say that I don't have an outside reference in my paintings. I, um, I'm not looking at anything when I'm making them. And, and what I usually do is create um, uh, or start one painting from the remnants of another painting so that I may have, um, for instance, you know, I, I may borrow a form from a um, given painting, a, a section of a painting, and use that as a departure point for the next painting. Um, and um, it's, it's, it, I, I should say too that it's, it's never entirely clear to me, this is what I meant a moment ago when I said that, you know, it's a kind of a totally improvised process. Um, and again, something that I think the images uh, often, uh, don't communicate that well um, is that um, the the process is one where I don't know where it's going to end up, and I mean I suppose the easiest way for me to describe that is just to say that uh, I don't I don't draw this type of form out um, ahead of time and then fill it in with 
colors. Uh, usually there is some small bit of very cursory drawing at the beginning of the process. And then um, over a long period of time, things really change and develop. So while I don't, I, I sometimes keep a photographic record of the evolution of a painting. Um, I don't, in this case, have that record. But I think that, um, you know, if, if you look closely, you can begin to see, particularly along the edges of forms, you can begin to see that, that things have moved and changed their positions, their colors, um, you know, in many cases, their orientation. Um, Oops, wrong way. Okay, there we go. Now, um, I'm going back here for just a moment to reference an earlier um, phase of the painting, and 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 that's uh, you know the landscape painting. Um, and I think an important distinction for me in my own work um, is, and the difference between the earlier work and the later work is not so much you know, the kind of obvious differences between representational work and non-objective work or between this more, I don't know, loose painterly approach to putting the, the, the image together uh, versus, um, uh, uh, you know, I suppose a, a flatter, uh, more coloristically driven approach. Um, but, but I think that the real difference has to do with time. Um, and, and so, you know, whether it's a landscape painting like this, um, which I tended to work pretty rapidly, um, or another example would be a still life painting along these lines, um, where I may have, just by virtue of the fact that this is a larger painting, I may have worked on this longer, but the, 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 the method that I employed was to work very, very quickly. Um, in the case of the landscape painting, uh, I would say that they're done almost, um, ex, you know, in one shot. Um, it might be three hours or four hours or five hours, but whatever it was, I was usually finished at the end of the, the, the day, finished with the painting. It very, very seldom went back and worked on it again. And, and in a painting like this landscape, I think you can, you can sort of, or not landscape, rather, still life, I think you can also see, um, you know, just perhaps in the the the, the speed um, of the strokes themselves you can see the manner in which that I in which I worked um, if I compare it to a painting like this you know the the big thing for me has to do with time as I said a moment ago um, the representational painting the the landscape painting um, the still life painting had a, an almost performative quality about it. it. It lived or died in an afternoon, and there was really seldom ever any going back. The advantages and the seductions of such paintings are, are certainly, you know, among other things, they have a kind of freshness and spontaneousness to them. Um, they're done in a sense immediately, and they have a resulting immediacy about them. You know, I, you know, the thing that that comes to my mind is something like a, a gesture drawing. Um, it it's not labored. You know, when it's successful, it feels, um, you know, as if it was uh, as, as if it just materialized rather than than something that was made. And 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 that's a that's that's a wonderful you know lovely quality to that type of painting. Um, but it wasn't something. Um, that I wanted, that, well, rather, I should say, I, I felt that there was something missing for me. Um, you know, non-objective painting can be done very, very quickly, but um, it, for me, in any case, what was, what was important was the idea that I could live with these things for a very long time. I think, I think, you know, this, this may have to do with just the fact that I've, as I've gotten older, you know, I've wanted to spend more time with a painting. Um, I, you know, I feel somewhat less impetuous. Um, 
that that's of course not going to be true for everybody but but certainly for me it was and particularly when i was working in with with the landscape um you know i i wanted to find a way to spend more time with something i wanted to find a way to um you know, explore the of a painting and um to give it time to emerge time to change in a sense time to live a kind of a life you know from from one uh starting point to the next and and as a result you know things come and go i think you know there's there's ample evidence in this painting if you look for instance in the upper left hand corner or the right hand section uh, th there are you know i think in this slide it's easy enough to see um where earlier manifestations of the painting were um i think this this idea of of moving back into the studio and painting um for a long period of time was one that 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 satisfied something deep in me as an artist and and something which i knew was not um i wasn't going to get from working uh in the landscape oops sorry again there we go Oops. The other thing that I simply couldn't find a way of doing meaningfully when I was painting the landscape was to work large. Many of these non-objective paintings are in the neighborhood of seven feet on a given side my my own inclination has always been towards the monumental uh, rather than the intimate and uh, the non-objective form language that that i've been working with lends itself more to that kind of exploration than something like a landscape or a still life um, and again not to say that there aren't monumental landscapes certainly there are many you know wonderful artists come to mind but um but it wasn't uh something that i felt that that i could do and um at the same time something that i was interested in doing and working large and working monumentally um and um and it just wasn't possible with either that subject matter or uh that form language This is this is a piece that's that's in the show. I want to say also, you know, when I've worked from direct observation, my, my goal was to try to organize my sensations into some sort of coherent, you know, pictorial expression. I'm 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 interested in I'm I'm captivated by a set of facts before me, the objects, the spaces that I perceive, and I'm largely I feel I'm largely beholden to them when I'm in the landscape, you know. So. I, I, I see a form, a, a car, a tree, a, a bench, uh, something like that in the landscape, or in, if it's an object in a still life, I, I have some uh, sense of responsibility to those forms, um, to their colors, to their general shapes. I may not be particularly interested in the details of, of, of the things, but I, I still feel nonetheless a sense of obligation or responsibility to the, to the forms generally to the way that they appear to me um and you know and it may seem odd to say but in the non-objective painting i'm i'm still interested in the facts the way i was when i was working in the landscape the difference being that now rather than responding to those facts i feel as if i'm i'm trying to create them 
from whole cloth. And, and I, I realize inevitably this process is, is kind of circuitous. It involves assembling and disassembling, asserting and, and denying, placing and displacing. I stop when I'm more or less convinced that the picture is what it had to be. Um, and, and, you know, to the extent that that's consistent with this notion of improvisation, I, I, I just mean to say that I, I don't have an end game in my mind um, other than some kind of a feeling um, uh, that I don't have anything more to say on the subject, you know, and, and then it's sim simply time to move on to the next image. This is another piece that's in the exhibition. Um, I was, I was recently asked by somebody about the titles of these paintings. Um, this is Ouroboros. Um, the, the previous painting was called The Sentinel. Um, this, this painting is um, uh, called Carnival in Lent. And, and, and I, I realized that, um, and, you know, especially, you know, the question that was put to me recently was, you know, what do these titles mean? And, 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 I, and I should say that I, I don't have a good answer to that question. I, the painting process itself is, is pretty improvisational and, um, you know, one where over the course of the, you know, the painting, um, which, as I said earlier, can, you know, take months or even years, there are various kinds of, I don't know, titles that, that come into my mind. I usually don't uh, title a painting until I'm done with it. And, um, and, and it's almost always just a result of the, the title popping into my head. Um, sometimes I think that I'm um, uh, it, that the, the title suggests itself um, to me, uh, as a result of uh, the co some combination of the forms there. Um, in other instances, um, a painting like this is uh, has a title which is just a sort of a dedication. In this case, uh, to uh, an American artist named Carl Knaths. I don't I don't know that he would necessarily be a um, uh, somebody that many people would recognize, but. Uh, uh, you know, he's a wonderful painter. There's actually an, a, a wonderful painting of his in the Dayton Art Institute. And um, it was just a painting that was on my mind when I painted this painting. And so I, I chose that as the title um, of the painting. This painting, for instance, is titled Jonah and the Whale. I haven't the slightest idea why this painting is titled Jonah and the Whale. It, 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 uh, it, it, I think it somehow felt to me like the right title for the painting, but there's no, there's no reference in here. And I certainly don't, don't want to suggest that there's some kind of hidden uh, meaning in these forms, uh, in, you know, where, wherein somebody might uh, discover Jonah or, or the whale. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but it, uh, it just seemed to me right at the time. The, 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 the painter, Robert De Niro, I don't know how many people are familiar with him. He, he's, he's actually the father of, um, uh, the actor, Robert De Niro. So his, the, the, the painter, Robert De Niro Sr. once said that an illustration is about something a painting is something. And this, this quote has always resonated with me. I, I feel when I'm making a painting that I'm trying to build something. It's, it's a something that's unique to painting in that it's built on a flat surface in a sense that it can exist in three dimensions. I think of it almost like a machine that I'm trying to put together. I imagine that when I'm finished, it is something a machine that works, 
doing what, I, I don't know, I can't say, but, but the goal in my mind anyway, is just simply to get it to work. I will admit something that's not in much fashion these days, I don't think. Um, but, but that, you know, as a painter, um, I'm a formalist. Um, I think, you know, throughout the whole time I've been painting, um, I, I would say, I would describe myself as a formalist. Um, my basic sense is that what's being communicated in a painting, a work of art, is a standalone thing with standalone emotions. I don't think paintings do a terribly good job of addressing the problems of the world or righting wrongs or absolving sins. For me, a painting first and foremost is something to be looked at. It's a physical thing. I, I don't think it's easy to look at a painting, especially not these days. Um, I think it requires time and patience and increasingly, uh, the cultivated ability to pay attention. Paintings do things. They are really very ancient forms of communication waiting quietly to be activated or switched on by the mind of the recipient. What they do, what they give is not really for me to say, hopefully a, a sense, a feeling perhaps. I'm interested in what happens in the mind of the viewer, regardless of what I think my painting is about or what it means to me when it leaves the studio my control of it is is sort of over with um it's been remarked to me that these paintings um have a figurative element that they read if not as figures then as figure ground i guess i can't control for such things it feels completely accidental in that i never think ahead of time about reference let alone a figure of course as i said the painter isn't necessarily the best source for information about what the painting is about. Often I work the paintings upside down or, or on their sides. Sometimes they stay that way. In fact, I like the idea that somebody who owns the painting might prefer to hang it in a different orientation entirely. Um, and I suppose like meaning itself, sometimes the object is at the discretion of the viewer. It, it's also been remarked, I'll just say, um, that the paintings have a sculptural quality. I can see this, but I think it has more to do with the sense of solidity that, I, that emerges from the colors and the shapes, or perhaps it's the sense of specificity of those things. In fact, one of the things that interests me about painting is when I sense that it, it can't be anything else. If I try to imagine this, for instance, in three dimensions, it falls apart. I love sculpture, but I wouldn't want to see this as an object in three dimensions. Ideally, I'd like to make things that continue to want to be looked at, things that move, change, surprise, please the viewer over time. When I'm making a painting, I feel as if I'm building something, like I said before, a machine of some kind or, or possibly playing a game. I would like for the viewer to see that machine as something that hums along or that game as something worth playing. I can't control for those things, but it's how I think about it when I step back. When in the end it's done, I hope it will be able to simply say, to paraphrase Ariel in Wallace Stevens's poem, The Planet on the Table, that I was glad I'd made my paintings. Um, and, and I sort of, as a final slide here, this is my studio uh, over at the university and an earlier incarnation of that painting. Um, I, I did want to just, uh, I'm going to switch gears here quickly. I did have a few remarks to make about um, uh, this, this idea of community that, that this show is built around. And, and um, I'll, I'll, I'm mindful of the time, but I'll, I'll just sort of read this. Um, and then perhaps if there are any questions or, or thoughts, I'd be happy to, uh, to speak to those. Um, so I just would like to say, you know, when Erica first asked me to participate in this exhibition, I was I was flattered, of course, but I was also a little perplexed. 
I've always seen art making, especially my relationship to it, as being, uh, you know, a, a solitary activity. Perhaps it's even a leftover romantic notion from some other era, but my sense of what the artist does is work alone for long stretches, trying to identify and resolve various problems, pictorial problems and concerns. I recognize that others see the activity of the artist differently as socially, politically, and psychologically expressive, or as having a social and political function, a utility um, that affects change. And when I read the description of the show, I felt a little bit like a fish out of water. I wondered, um, to Erica, in fact, what I could possibly contribute to such an exhibition. Naturally, she had a good answer. And, um, you know, for one thing, without almost even realizing it, I'd forgotten about the fact that, that I'm a member of two cooperative galleries, one in New York City and one in Dayton, both of which are important communities in my life. And then, you know, more importantly, I, I neglected to even consider the fact that I've been teaching for almost 30 years. And a school, if anything, is a community. An instructor enters the classroom with the goals of teaching content or in the case of the studio arts and helping students develop skills, see more clearly and understand those things in the context of art. One of the things that this pandemic has done is to remind me that the classroom is not simply a coincidental community, but a deliberate and necessary one. Learning to paint, for instance, is a somewhat solitary activity. It involves time and patience and practice, but having other artists around, other artists to learn from, is as valuable as good instruction. Indeed, my mind wanders to the larger community of artists, both the living and the dead, that we are always engaged with, Earlier, I showed a painting by Cezanne. Cezanne, who died 60 years before I was born and didn't speak a word of English, is nonetheless a member of a kind of community that I've spent the last 30 years putting together in my mind. His, his example and, and perhaps even his camaraderie has sustained me in my work. And of course, he's just one of dozens and dozens, perhaps hundreds of artists to have done that. I, I, I just wanted to share quickly, I don't know if anybody's ever seen this film called Mr. Turner, and uh, it, it's about the painter Turner, the 19th century British artist. And, um, you know, I, there's a scene in this movie where these artists are all gathered together, you know, in, in, in anticipation of the Salon um, exhibition opening. And um, as you can see, some of them are, are, they're not just hanging their works, but some of them are actually finishing their works as they're on the walls. Um, and I remember watching it and thinking that I could, I could almost smell the linseed oil in that room and hear the thoughts of the artists uh, fretting uh, over their work. Um, and again, you know, that sense of community, I, I had nothing to do with British 19th century painting, uh, but, but I could relate in some ways to um, what was going on in that room or a more a somewhat more recent example is, is the artist club in New York City, um, where artists would get together to discuss issues, topics of the day, um, or finally, a place like the Louvre, the, the museums, um, places that I love in particular. You know, in, in every instance, I think there's a kind of a kinship, a recognition of some common purpose and activity that, that binds people together. As I mentioned earlier, there are others who see the role of art as being more social and transformative to communities outside of artist communities. And, and I certainly, I recognize the value and meaning of such things, but for me, um, they're not the kinds of problems that, that uh, spark my imagination. Um, I don't believe that art can do everything. In fact, I, I often think it can do very little, but um, I think what it can do is, is transformative um, personally, uh, or rather on a personal level, and that that transformative quality inevitably uh, transforms communities. Um, and, um, and I think that, you know, wherever there's something that people can cohere around some aspect of that thing, you know, there's, there's a, 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 an important and vital community.
So anyway, that that is it. That's all I've got to say. Kat, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to uh, entertain them. That's great. Um, thank you so much. We do have some questions and also some hellos. Uh, Lorraine, Taddy, Diane Fitch, and Ann Kim all said hello on Facebook. Oh, that's um, nice. Hi to them if they're still here. <laughs> and then if you want to stop sharing your 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 screen, then sure. that'll be helpful. Uh, there we go. And let's see here. Um, from, so folks, if you have questions, please uh, drop them in the comments or drop them in the chat. We'd love to hear them. Um, so another one is, let's see here, Marsha Pippinger said, uh, that's a great fantasy talk. And then also said, that was a reference to earlier remark um, and they forgot to hit send. However, your remarks are extremely helpful to me. So more of a comment, which is lovely. Um, Hi, Marsha. <laughs> and uh, Erica is here too. Erica said, can you talk about your palette? I'm always blown away by the grays that you have. Can you tell us more? Oh, Erica. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I, you know, one of my favorite painters in the whole world is, is, is uh, Giorgio Morandi. Um, and uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with his work, you know, he's, he's by and large a still life painter. Um, but I, I, I think I've, I've seldom come across an artist who had a more refined and, and, and beautiful sense of color than, than Morandi. Um, and, and, and his paintings are, uh, I would say, very muted um, uh, in, in, in their, um, their color disposition, it, you know, their brownish grays and, and bluish grays and the occasional uh, uh, pink uh, or pale yellow. Uh, but I, um, you know, have always thought that they were the, the height of, of coloristic achievement. So I, I, don't, I don't know if I can answer the question, Erica, or, or, or say anything. I, I, the color is something that is uh, very mysterious to me. Um, I just work and try to adjust the colors and adjust the colors until there's some uh, some sense of uh, that it I don't know that it makes sense to me in some way um, you know that it works but I but beyond that I'm sorry I don't have a good answer <laughs> all right I we have no have... system no system uh, in other words uh, there's a comment from um, someone listed as black pond Wonderful to see your work and hear you speak, Glenn. I have to go to another Zoom meeting, but I'm interested in the fact that I expect your shapes to line up, but they don't. Thank you for bringing your work to this online community. Oh, Catherine Kehoe. Oh, that was uh, Catherine. I know. Well, it sounds like she went to another Zoom meeting, but uh, <laughs> I, I know Catherine. It's, I'm glad that she she tuned in. That's that's very nice. Um, we also have, let's see here from Diana. Could you speak more about your drawings, which I think are wonderful and their relation to your paintings? Oh, well, I mean, I, I showed very few drawings. I, I don't know if she was, is referring to the drawings that I, that I did show those ink drawings. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I tend to, to draw in, in, uh, in fits. Uh, and and um, often when I feel like I can't paint for one reason or another, um, or that uh, I need to take a break from painting, and and the drawings don't are uh, unlike the paintings. The drawings are not very monumental. They're usually pretty small, um, you know, uh, in the neighborhood of uh, oh eighteen by twenty four inches generally. So I you know, and I, I wouldn't say that the drawings are preparatory in any way. Um, they're just um, they're exploratory. I think of the drawings as ends in themselves, um, but they give me some ideas about how to um, move forward, you know, with a set of forms. If I, uh, some, sometimes I'll borrow something from a drawing, um, but, but again, in the painting, it almost always ends up um, changing. There's, there's very, I, I don't think I've ever made a drawing and then transferred the drawing to a painting. Um, so I, I don't know if that answers the question, but um, 
I think so. I, and I think uh, Diane is looking at your work online as well as the, the PowerPoint. So not just a, a singular comprehension of your work through this talk, but okay, okay. A, a deeper understanding. Um, Lorraine Taddy would like to know, how has the work of your colleagues influenced your progression? Oh, um, well, tremendously uh, in, in, in many respects. You know, I was thinking about this the other day. Uh, you know, when, well, of course, Lorraine, I'm not exactly sure if she's referring to my colleagues, say, at the university um, or, or more broadly about just sort of colleagues. Um, you know, uh, I can say, for instance, I don't know if she's still on the line here, but but Diane Fitch, who is a, a, a former colleague of mine and, and a wonderful friend and a tremendous painter, has had a, an incredible influence on me um, and my thinking and on my ability to see and, and, and to look at things. And she introduced me to, well, I, I shouldn't say she introduced me, she made me see Piero della Francesca in a way that I had not, I hadn't the, the, I suppose the maturity <laughs> or the presence of mind to see on my own. And, uh, and that uh, little simple act it, it completely changed my life. So, so I, that my colleagues have been a, a tremendous influence um, always. And, and sometimes, you know, and I suppose like anything, right, that in the, in the, in a, well, in a negative sense, I don't mean negative that it's, it's unpleasant, but, but that, um, you know, they, they do things or think things that you don't agree with. And, and then you end up, it helps to form your own sense of, you know, what it is, you know, I, I, I have learned more about what I believe by seeing it in contrast to what, what other people believe, um, whether it's painting or anything else, but, but in the case of painting, certainly. So I don't know, Lorraine, I hope that answers it. I'm, I'm not sure. That's great. Um, Marsha said, I love Mirandi and high back. And then Stacy said, uh, this was great. Love your work. Didn't realize how much I missed your art talks. Thank you. Um, and then Joan said, since the light is constantly changing outside when you paint, do you find that the interpretation becomes more reactionary and emotional when time is limited? Do you constantly rework the image during this time? I love your work. Thank you. Oh, um, well, of course, it, it, she's asking me to think back on, on the, when I was sort of an active landscape painter. Um, I, I, what I can say is, and I sort of, I referenced this in the talk, I, I'm, um, I, I worked very, very quickly in the landscape. So whatever happened, happened, you know, at four or five, six hours, uh, you know, there is a constant changing, but I'm not a sense, I wasn't a sensitive painter, you know, like I didn't, for instance, have a morning painting that that just dealt with the morning light and then an afternoon painting that dealt with the afternoon light. I was really very clumsy and, and uh, you know, would just, whatever happened in the moment is what happened. And, and um, I was thankful if, if, if it wasn't a complete disaster at the end of, of whatever period of time I was out there. But yeah, it, for, for a, a landscape painter, a, a, a real landscape painter, I think those, those kinds of concerns are, are, you know, are incredibly important. Uh, Kathy would like to say, I love how you play with overlaying your inventive forms with some of them feeling opaque and some feeling transparent. It is a pleasure to hear your thoughts, Glenn. Thank you. So more of a comment. Oh, um, thank you, Kathy. And then Amy has a question. I wonder if you could describe a typical work day in the studio, or if you could talk about how you know when a work is complete. Um, yeah, I, so a typical work day in the studio. Well, you know, I, uh, I, I used to smoke cigarettes a long time ago. So there, there used to be a lot of cigarettes um, <laughs> in a typical day in the studio. Um, Thankfully, that's that's over with. There's there's for me. Uh, there, there's there's I, I mentioned before. This is a a, a a a slow motion improvisational process, and um, so there's a lot of of sort of standing back and looking 
uh, at at what uh, you know I'll, I'll do something and then I'll stand back and look at it and see what I think about it if I really um, at a loss I'll as I said before I'll, I'll turn the painting upside down or I'll turn it on its side and I'll continue to work on it that way it, it usually allows me to kind of break out of 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 you know what feels like a, a rut um, that I might be in at the moment um, I you know I'd I'd, I'd like to work for six or seven hours in the studio at a clip um, and um, and then come back and the next day and sort of go through that process of seeing what it looks like um, and whether it looks good. You know, probably all painters have this experience or all artists, you know, you, you end the day and sometimes if you end it on a high note, um, you go home and you feel good about what you did and uh, but then, after you know, by the next morning, you're a little nervous about whether or not it's going to hold up, and and sometimes it does, and, and you're sort of pleasantly surprised. And other times, it's it's uh, it it tells you that it needs to be worked on again. Um, and then, as far as when a painting is finished, I I I I I mentioned this a little bit briefly in the talk. I, I don't have any clear sense of that at all. I know that painters have struggled with that question for um, many, many years. And it's, 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 it's a topic that comes up, um, you know, almost constantly. I, I think it's really a fascinating one, but I don't have any good answer. I, I, I work on the painting. I, I don't, um, I don't know, maybe the only thing I can say about this, and I'm just uh, reiterating something I said earlier is that I, I, I don't really think of this as a terribly intellectual process. I, I think of it as, very much a physical process. The painting is something that you deal with physically, um, and uh, you know you react to it. And then, either you know, like Cezanne, you just abandon it because you you know that it just seems impossible um, to continue, or else you feel, I guess, relatively satisfied that it, that it resolved itself in some way. Um, that it, as I said earlier, that it, that it made some kind of sense to you, or that, you know, maybe to extend that that machine metaphor, that it that it worked, that it 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 actually did something. Um, but uh, but I, I I don't I don't ever know when it, when it's finished. Um, I, in fact, I'll just say this: I don't even know if they are finished now. I, I mean, I I I I sometimes think they're finished. And then a month later or two months later, I realized they're not finished. And then at other times, uh, I don't think they're finished. And then I realized later that I should have thought they were finished. Um, you know, that's usually after I've, I've ruined the thing. So anyway, I hope that makes some sense. It does. I, I think you're a bit of a painter's painter. Um, the, the other thing that I find really interesting about your work is that you flattened them like visually you've tried to flatten them in a way, but when you get up close to the works, they have immense depth just by the nature of how you allow layers to peek through. Um, the other thing that I wanted to, to talk through with you and, and get your response on, I know you say you're a formalist. I appreciate that. The, the exhibition that this is, is, is artists who are building community. So thinking about, um, you know, the intersection of how you contain these multitudes being an artist and a teacher and a community maker um, are inseparable because they're all a part of you. Mm -hmm. I also think about how very, very fundamentally painting is all about relationship. Like this color next to this color is a relationship that allows our eyes to see very similar to the way that this person with another person allows this community to grow. So just planting that and looking for a response. Uh, you said it very nicely, Kat. I'm not so sure I could say I could add anything, you know, to, to, to make that that any better. Um, you know, I I, 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 I realize in some ways that 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 maybe the word formalism has a kind of an exclusive quality about it or 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 a somewhat I don't know, maybe a, a, a monastic quality about it. Uh, you know that uh, this is a kind of uh, 
some sort of esoteric language, uh, you know, that that um, is is um, you know that that is is only designed for a select group of people. I, you know, I don't. I, ideally, I I don't think of it that way myself. Um, but I but I think when I use the term formalist, I just simply mean that I think that the 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 what a, what a painting is is uh, communicating, uh, uh, and it doesn't need to be an, a non-objective painting. I think it could be any kind of painting. What what a painting is communicating is um, something that sort of exists outside of of um, you know metaphor and outside of of analog. It it I you know I think paintings are 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 sort of they can be deeply spiritual and um they can be intellectually stimulating and and, and emotionally stimulating and indeed i would i would want them to to do those things um but i but i don't um and 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 i know that other people you know that that the uses of art and the the functions of art are are manifold but um you know, for me, I'm I'm satisfied on some level if 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 a person if I'm actually able to make a connection to another person vis-a-vis -vis the work. I I, I I don't know if I addressed all of your thoughts. You had more than that, and I kind of got caught up in no, that. That was great. One. Yeah, that was great. Um, I think I'm going to give you one last comment, um, which is from Lorraine. It said, "Thank you, Glenn. Beautiful, loving the poetic constructions of color and shape." and some mark making and rewarding equivocal or push and pull spatial tension. Some nice quotable quotes in your talk also, take care. And with that, um, we are at time, just a couple minutes over time. Okay. Thank you so much, Glenn, for your time and, and sharing your work with us and your great words. Um, thank you for everyone that joined us. This. Uh, is recorded, so we'll have it available for those that didn't get a chance to see all of it. You'll you'll have a chance a little later. Um, and thank you to the governor's office and Ohio legislature for supporting the arts and allowing a space like the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery to exist and amplify artists' voices. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks.